Ann Carnes is a vegetable farmer from Crothersville, Indiana. And um, she is in year nine of being a veggie farmer, and um, she moved home to Indiana a couple of years ago with her farm. And so this will be year three at her current place, and she's figuring out how to make biologically active compost, and she's going to show us videos. It should be fun. Okay, so the title of our project is Leveraging Biodiversity to Improve Profitability on a Small-Scale Vegetable Farm. That sounds really boring, doesn't it? Um, but the overview of the project is it's a multi-farm venture, so we have collaborated with other small farms to create a biologically diverse compost from livestock bedding to improve the health of the soil and the profitability of our small-scale vegetable farm. So what we're basically, what does that mean, right? We talked a lot about compost today, about how compost is not all treated equal. So we want to monitor our compost with a microscope. We want to see what's going on in there, what's alive, what kind of diversity can we get, and how can that affect how the crops grow. And what we're hoping is that we can use that biology to eliminate the need for additional inputs. We want to stop using fertilizer. We want to, well, we try not to use pesticides, but you know, we want to stop those inputs that are not only expensive, but you have to apply them every year. Whereas with biology, it's a living organism. You can introduce it and maintain a healthy habitat for it. It, in theory, will continue to thrive and do the nutrient cycling. It will, you know, do all the things. Be born, die, reproduce, eat, poop, all bits. So, let's talk about the compost a little bit and how we have decided to develop the biologically diverse compost. We started with the, so the picture on the right side is the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. It is a static pile style to make compost. It's just a fencing frame that has um, a hole in the center. So it actually looks like a donut. Should have gotten a picture from the top. What that allows for is oxygen to be able to access all the bits. So there's no center point that goes anaerobic or loses oxygen, which is where you get the pathogens and kind of the bad guys start to form. So the center is open, everything is within a foot of air, and it just hangs out. So we filled this a year ago, last summer. Well, the livestock farmer was filled it, thanks Liz. <laughs> but, um, so that just hung out. So we're just now beginning to analyze what's going on there, and you're going to get to see a video of that. And that's, we just use an apple cord to pull the samples from the center, and we also have um, the chicken bedding in an isolated form too. So we kept the feedstock separate which was our first mistake. There wasn't a diverse enough feedstock to provide diverse enough microbiology to be effective. So we're seeing some biology there, but it's just not gonna be enough to offset all the things we wanted to do. So this season, we are going to change our method of making compost, and it is also a SARE sponsored grant program. So the Johnson C. Bioreactor was a SARE program back, I don't know how long ago, um, and then the other one that we're developing is also based on other research done through SARE, and it's Dr. Lynn Elam's soil food web approach. So it is a thermal composting method, which means that we're hitting temperature for a certain amount of time, kill weed seeds, kill pathogens, there's turning involved, but we will use the same framing from the bioreactor to keep it consolidated. So great for urban environments. You don't need big equipment, don't need big windrows. Um, so it is kind of contained, I guess, if you will. And we use five-gallon buckets to develop the recipe. So we're going to develop a recipe that can be repeatable so we can continue to produce the compost that has the diversity of microbiology. Uh, so that's the sugar snap peas that we grew. We just let it dry in the field in the sun, stuff it into buckets. We'll add water to the buckets, and that will be one of the feedstocks. So we'll have, that will be our green, We'll have the sheep bedding, which will be nitrogen and woody, or I guess that'll be brown. Um, anyway, we're going to hit all the bits. High nitrogen, hopefully with um, some brewery waste grain, and also the chicken bedding will be woody and high nitrogen as well. So hopefully we'll develop a recipe that works, and we will be able to test out that microbiology and see what happens. This is an overview of the field. Uh, so this is where I've taken samples of the current status of the microbiology. So all those little markers we've done in, in areas that we've planted, either annual crops or perennial crops, places that have been fallow. 
um, places that aren't dipped in disturbs that just aren't even growing weeds very well, and then the surrounding woods. So to determine kind of just an analysis of the area. And what we have found actually is just bacteria. There is zero diversity in all the parts. It is basically the same everywhere, even in the woods. Um, there's a little bit of fungal hyphae, but none of the higher level predators, uh, which you'll get to see videos of, and you don't need to remember the names of right now. But, um, so it's gonna be really interesting to see um, how this changes. And what's really great about this method is once we have the compost, we make an extract with it. So we just take a small bit, put it in water, and then we do a soil drench in the fall. And then the microbiology will do its thing, nutrient cycle, and then come spring, we'll, we won't fertilize, we won't till, we'll just plant into it, and hopefully see a yield increase. <laughs> so that's the plan. Um, and we'll see how that goes, yet to be determined. So let's play this video while we talk some more. Can I press play? Where do I press play? I just click it. Anybody know how to do that? Anybody know how to press play? <laughs> try. Okay, it usually has like a little bar at the bottom. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is a sample from our bioreactor 3 from the sheep bedding that was filled last season. This was just taken a couple days ago. Um, and it's spliced together. So there's clips that are both at 10x objectives and 40x objectives with the shadowing microscope. So this allows us to see the living organisms. And I am learning, so I'm not going to try to like, identify all of them, but there's definitely some kind of spore, maybe a meaty fungal hyphae thing going on here. Um, so we have seen some, some additional of uh, the level of the higher predators that are going to be eating the bacteria and um, adding to those nutrients. But the reason that we wanted to test this method and why we we're so interested in it is if basically by developing a microbiology, we reduce or hopefully eliminate a lot of our input costs. And on a small scale operation, those can be quite a significant percentage of our returns. So um, that's really our main goal is to just not have to be dependent upon buying in those resources. Um, but there are some management styles that have to happen in order to do that. We need to eliminate tilling or reapply the biology if we're going to till. Uh, we can't use any fertilizer, whether it's synthetic or organic. Certified organics are also out as well. That includes certified organic pesticides. Those are still chemicals that kill microbiology. So it is you know, willing to take that time to just let it balance itself out. So there may be some, you know, crop failures in the mix of that. Um, so we will have some plots that we, um, yeah, there's a nematode. They're fast moving. Uh, they're actually not bad. Uh, there are some that live in anaerobic conditions that will eat roots, uh, but for the most part, they are eating biology and adding to the nutrient cycling, even though they look terrifying. Um, <laughs> And watch. But so basically we're just hoping to monitor what we have and then really be able to be the test subjects to see does this, can this work? Uh, so we don't know, we'll find out. So um, happy to open it up to any questions if anybody wants to know more. You can also go to the SARE website to see our proposal and then our report uh, should be up there in January. Um, and then our website, wellpansyfarm.com, will also have um, some information about where we are now. i um, hoping to get that page up by the end of next week. So, yeah, anybody have any questions? Uh, do you do the testing yourself or yes or no? Yeah, so the question is do I do the testing myself? And yeah, I am in the process of getting my lab tech certification to do this. So I am, part of this program was getting trained to do the analysis. Um, but it's new to me. I do not have a science background or a business background. So um, it's really cool because I think a lot of people actually can do it because it's just counting. It's not, there's a little bit of ID involved and then it's just numbers. It's not, I don't need to know the specifics of like the species, for example. It's, it's a condition base. So as long as the compost is aerobic, the species aren't going to be pathogenic. If it goes to anaerobic and loses oxygen, then we've got problems. 
So I'm monitoring for conditions and then counts. But there are people that are starting to do this kind of testing um, and making it more and more available. So um, the goal will be hopefully that more people are doing the microbiology analysis and you can just send it in and get more tests. <laughs> Uh, so you said you're going to have a recipe developed. Are you going to have like an estimate, like X number of sheep will be able to provide enough mm. biology for X number of acres or chickens or you know some kind of formula so you can say this is what I'm growing in vegetables. What am I going to need to implement this on my farm? Right. So the question is, is there going to be kind of a analysis of sheep, bedding, quantitative analysis of um, the recipe. And to a degree, yes, like we will have, this is how much bedding we brought in, this is roughly how much compost we got out. I don't know how great we'll be on our accuracy of all of that because some got lost in the, in the process. But um, yes, that is the goal. But I think that because it is so location specific, like the, what the sheep are eating, is going to be different than what the sheep are eating at the farm 200 miles away. So there's a lot, so many factors. It really is place specific. So it's the concepts that can translate, but maybe not the recipe, if that makes sense. But maybe it will. But yeah, we, we will provide information about how much bedding input went in, how much compost came out, and um, what the effects were. That's a close-up uh, view of a nematode, and the way that I have been taught to identify them, because they're basically just making sure that there's not root feeders, because those can negatively affect your plants. Um, and you're looking at the top part is the head, and the way that the lips and the, the internal digestive system of their look, you can kind of identify. So the root feeders have this sphere, um, type appearance that is more obvious, and I don't think that's one because, but you know, it's not perfect. Um, but there, you can slow them down with a lighter and kind of get a better look at what you're dealing with. But like I said, we, we only had a few, and we want to see many more in order to have that proper nutrient cycle. Mm -hmm. This one is a closer, so these both of these screens were at 40x, so that's the highest objective that I have. Um, and the little dots that are moving around are bacteria, and then most of those in there are just aggregates or soil particles. Um, you can see ones that kind of look like glass, that's sand. Um, and then it's either a cyst or an amoeba that's kind of going dormant on the, the top left, so it's got little weird things in the center. That's how you tell it's something alive. <laughs> And then this last one is, a, I think, a nice example of a fungal hyphae. So you can tell that it's different from a root because it's got sharper edges and really clearly defined out, outer rims. And um, so they actually are quite easy to tell the difference between roots if you can get both ends. Now, if you're just getting a sample that's going across the whole screen, you might not be able to tell. Um, but um, yeah, you just focus in and out and you can kind of see it get blurry and then more in focus and you just kind of play around with that. I think they look like abstract art. Does anybody else have some questions? Yeah. So how do you focus on microbiology and incorporate manures without introducing E. coli? So that's where the thermal composting comes in. So if we get the time and the temperature, that eliminates the pathogens. And then in addition to that, the um, E. coli, for example, is an anaerobic um, bacteria. So if we keep it aerobic with oxygen, we won't produce that. Um, so that would be monitoring for that. Because I can't tell if this is E. coli. The bacteria in here from this screen, I can't tell what kind of bacteria it is. There are certain bacteria that have different shapes that are bad or pathogenic. I call them bad guys. I'm not a scientist. Um, and they're very specific shapes. So there are some clear indications that your soil is gone anaerobic because you will see them. And they're very obvious. Anybody else? Any questions? I think that's my time. <laughs>